And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post podcast on a Monday afternoon where the scorching Phoenix Suns just fended off Point Dort and beat the Oklahoma City Thunder to go 6-0 and in the bubble. Let me tell you this. One of the great pleasures of going out to Los Angeles to do the jump is exchanging small talk with NBA diehard Mike Schwartz, one of our ace researchers at ESPN, always about the Suns. Mike is, I think, mm-hmm. the only Suns fan I actually know. And, and his optimism, every time I go to L.A., he's so happy and optimistic about the Suns. And I've seen him beaten down time and time again. But my friend, your optimism has paid off the Suns, if they went out, will finish at 34 and 39. They need help, but at least they give themselves mm-hmm. a shot. So, like, are you just, are you sleeping? Are you on a bender? How are you celebrating this? Bender, no, no pun not- intended. Bender, I'm sorry <laughs> I said bender. I'm not, I'm not on a Chris either, I can tell you that much. I put Ooh. those years way behind me. But, yeah, Zach, this is the most exciting Phoenix Suns basketball has been for 10 years. I'm used to rooting for lottery balls at this time of the year. That's what I've been doing most of the last decade. So to watch this team actually having a chance, if they uh, beat Philadelphia tomorrow, they'll go down to the final day with a chance to make the playoffs. Never would have thought that when the league went on to hiatus. Well, look, I mean, first of all, we scheduled this podcast yesterday. And then Oklahoma City sat everybody but Chris Paul in their starting lineup. And I sent you an email Mm -hmm. saying, hey, if they're up like 30 in the fourth (laughs) quarter, we can start recording early. And like I hit send on that. And then DeAndre Ayton misses his COVID test or the news comes out that he misses his COVID test and he's not playing. And I'm thinking this is too cruel for Phoenix Suns fans. If they lose to like the junior varsity Thunder and Chris Paul, who apparently will just never not play – in part because the franchise center, the guy they selected over Luka Doncic, who, by the way, I'm not losing all, I mean, I'm losing some sleep over that, but I'm not losing like Vlade Divac's level sleep over that. Um, mm-hmm. uh, missed his COVID test. I just, that would be a, a blow. That would be a, a bridge too far for me. And then, of course, he comes to the game and I'm picturing, I think he should have <laughs> had to be driven to the game in a golf cart by somebody dressed as one of the Disney characters. I want to see Mickey or Goofy driving DeAndre Ayton in a high-speed golf cart across the campus. Yeah, I mean, that's really inexcusable. You've got three games left. They're all must-wins. And the Franchise Center misses a COVID test. You're thinking, what do you have to do? Obviously, we've seen guys are fishing. I'm sure video games are being played. But I really don't know how you miss a COVID test when that's literally the one thing you have to do on a day off. It's not great. Uh, he came in and played pretty well today. I think yeah. DeAndre Ayton's had a, had a nice a, a nice bubble performance. And even today, the thing I'm always watching for him is how often can we get him rolling super hard to mm-hmm. the rim. And today he had a bunch of he got a tip out of it. He got an offensive rebound dunk. He like he's he's and defensively, he held his own switching on to Chris Paul. Chris baited him into a little touchy elbow foul, foul one time. But like I don't know that I've seen a player. I don't know that I've seen a bigger leap on defense from mm-hmm. a big man from year one to year two than DeAndre Ayton. I've been saying this all year. I mean, I don't think he's like great or or whatever, but I, I think he's like an average-ish starting center, which is pretty good. Yeah, and going back to U of A, he's always had the quick feet. He's able to at least do a reasonable job against the small guys out on the perimeter, and I think that's just so important. Um, He's a guy who's not going to be played off the court per se because he can't guard the perimeter. And then the rim defense, that's the huge thing. He was one of the worst bigs at rim defense last year, giving up 56%. This year he's down to 45. And if he can continue that trajectory, and to me it's all the defensive awareness, he still gets caught napping at times. Um, Not the best in that regard, but I think that might be the key. Can he become going from now a, a bad defensive center to an average one? if he can become a good one, because that's what this team's going to need if you really want to become a contender. So when the news when the news came out that he missed his test, mm-hmm. did you did your optimism wane? Did you think this is really what this is really destiny that we're going to crumble because of this against against the Thunder team? Or, or did you were you like, you know what, if he's out the whole game, Frank the tank, let's go fire up the Frank tank. Kaminsky didn't even play today uh, and, and we're, and we're going to be fine. 
No, I'm, I've never want to fire up the Frank tank. I'm still a U of A guy, so I'm uh, a little bit sour over the final that Elite Eight loss. But honestly, if, if they were facing any starting center other than Mike Muscala, I might have been a little bit concerned. But I had a feeling Dario Saric would be able to hold his own against Muscala. Um, and honestly, my, my first reaction, like you said, Zach, trying to always go to the positive, sons of a back-to-back tomorrow. We don't know if Joel Embiid's going to play or not. I wanted Aiton to be nice and rested to face Philly tomorrow. Well, he's going to be nice and rested even though they played today because Oklahoma City eventually reality set in. And so that's, I mean, this is your problem going forward, right? Is the Suns Mm -hmm. need to win out. I mean, they don't actually need to win out, but realistically, they absolutely have to win out. And and Philly, maybe they get without Embiid and all that, but you're counting on... You know, Portland has the Mavs and the Nets. The mm-hmm. Mavs are like massively important to you guys because you play the Mavs and yep. so does Portland. And their last game is against the Nets. Um, Memphis has Boston and Milwaukee. And it's like they could go 0-2, 1-1, and 2-0. It's like we have no idea. Giannis is not playing tonight for the Bucs as mm-hmm. we're taping this now. We don't know what that and what that. So you're, you're dependent on a lot of things that are out of your control, which is your punishment for being whatever you were 26 and 39 coming into the bubble but um it's just i mean i i just this must be you must be in heaven this has been they and by the way they've been legitimately really fun to watch there's no question about that yeah and i mean all you can do is is take control of what you can as any team has the suns have lost so many winnable games they had a tough one against portland earlier in the year that came down to some a questionable uh, blocking call and there's so many games you can look at but yeah if if you go eight and oh I, I still would be just super optimistic because the Suns will then go ahead and have the 10th best lottery odds so you might take this then go into the lottery have a you know 20 percent or so chance of moving up and and go ahead and getting one of those top prospects so I feel like the good juju would be there for the Suns if, if they actually went eight and oh and missed this by one game that I'd be waiting for lottery night and saying, yeah, the luck's going to come back around that way. Well, lottery night has been has been a little dicey for the Suns in the yep, last seven yeah. or eight years. Or not lottery night, I should say huh. draft night. Um, so let's zoom out because here are, here are the Suns now in 2020, August 2020, the sensation mm-hmm. of the league. October 2013, they make an organi- organizational decision to tank. Right, they trade Gortat to Washington for a first round pick. Yep. Everyone's like, Got "Oh, Ryan McDonough, yep. Ryan McDonough is the new GM. They're tearing it down. Finally, Sarver is going to tank." Um, they accidentally win forty eight games and almost make the playoffs. However, my mm-hmm. point is this: from twenty thirteen accidental tanking after the Lance Blanks regime, which was a disaster, to twenty twenty sensation of the league, you could not possibly in infinity tries replicate how the Hmm. Suns got from point A to point Z. There are so many crazy events and turning points. And really, like, the process was not exactly smooth. They made a lot of mistakes. And the NBA Mm -hmm. can be forgiving because you get high picks when you're bad. And they got a really good player at number one. They also missed on a lot of high picks. So, again, let's take that timeline from accidentally not tanking but trying to tank 2013 till now. What are some moments that stand out from you? Where what what lessons can other team can other teams look at this and be like, well, that was a mistake, or that actually worked out okay? What stands out to you? Well, I mean, I think the biggest thing is they had so many bites at the apple. Um, they get made fun of all the time for the missed lottery picks, and of course, 2016, you pick Dragan Bender at four, you trade up to get Marquise Chris, you trade away Bogdan Bogdanovich in that mm-hmm. deal, and both of those guys complete bust the next year. You pass on De'Aaron Fox, Larry Markinen, and you go ahead and draft Josh Jackson, which was a complete disaster. But then you keep having enough bites at the apple. Eventually, you're going to hit on something. And the biggest trip pick, obviously, was the number 13 pick in 2015 when you hit on Devin Booker. And that's kind of the, the key going forward that since 2015, it's really been all about how can you build a team around Booker. And they swung and missed several times, uh, finally win the lottery in 2018. And no, they didn't pick the right guy. Luka Doncic is already an MVP candidate, but they did pick a guy who I think is going to be a really good number two who works well with Book and DeAndre Ayton. And then in that same draft, um, to zoom back out to the 2015 trade deadline when the Suns did all sorts of crazy stuff. 
I, Unbelievable. It, yeah, I, in my head, I was at dinner with my or lunch with my dad, and we just had no idea who was even on the team by the end of that. They traded Goran Dragic to Miami. They got two future first-round picks. But then they also uh, traded away Isaiah Thomas for pretty much nothing to Boston before he became an all-NBA type guy. And they acquired Brandon Knight and eventually signed him to a long-term deal, which obviously was a disaster. But those two picks, <laughs> they traded on uh, 2018 draft day right after acquiring DeAndre Ayton, and they got Mikel Bridges out of that. And he's just... I'd say Mikel Bridges would be a perfect fit on any team, but he's a guy who's always going to take the best perimeter offensive player. Uh, he's becoming a decent three-point shooter, really good slasher, just a perfect, perfect uh, high-level role player. And then this last draft, uh, the, the last offseason was kind of interesting for the Suns. A lot of pundits made fun of it because if you look including, at each deal in, in, on a, including me by the way i had i i okay. made fun of it i made fun of it you, and um, and that's totally fair you, sh- you should have made fun of it i mean they traded they had to trade away the 32nd pick in the draft to get rid of tj warren which honestly i was okay with because the guy averages one assist per game he still averages one assist per game but he's and also that, averaging like a thousand points per yeah. game in the bubble. Yeah, the last five games. But, but overall, it's interesting season, It's interesting you say that because I think the Suns lost no sleep over it. I don't absolutely. think any of their fans are losing sleep over it. And when you have success like this, it's easy to be like, well, it didn't – It's a. it was a – I mean, objectively, that's a bad trade. Now, sure. they traded him for cap space really, right? And they used the cap yes. space in ways that have essentially worked. That said, you shouldn't have to – incentivize a team to take tj warren like tj warren is actual trade value much more now than he did a year ago but even if even if like the result is okay there's an opportunity Mm -hmm. cost to a deal like that just like there's an opportunity cost to salary dumping josh jackson on memphis and and also d'anthony melton who's good although javon carter is, is playing really nicely for them off the bench anyway please continue Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's another deal, obviously, bad value deal. And the other deal they made, they traded uh, the six pick, which that was after some poor lottery luck. Um, They you would have thought they had one of the best uh, chances to go ahead and move up. So then moving the six was kind of a disappointment. And then you trade down to 11, uh, get Dario Saric and pick Cam Johnson, who absolutely nobody had at 11 on their board. And it's actually turned out that he might be the perfect kind of stretch four. He's in lights out three point shooter, really smart player. He's, I think, one of the oldest players in the draft. He's older than Devin Booker, which is kind of insane. Since Devin Booker, uh, Booker is was, like just not just barely twenty three years old. Right, right. It's he's, insane how good Devin Booker is. Yeah, that's it's, the I mean, one thing I've been consistent on all along, even making fun of the Suns. I am a yeah. long time holder of all the Devin Book and Booker stock I can buy, and I'm not cashing it in. I'm keeping it because I think he's going to keep getting better. Good. I mean, you're you're going to get a, quite a return on that investment. You're going to get some All NBA appearances out of that. Uh, possibly should have even been this year if they hadn't. Done he would have made it this him. year if they if they yeah. had set, if they had kept it. Which it's ridiculous that they didn't count the seeding games. I've been consistent about that, and he yeah. is the single biggest individual loser because he would have made All NBA. He was on the fringe of my sixth and final spot, which I gave to Ben Simmons. And I'm telling you yeah. right now. If they had included these games, 100% I'm flipping Booker in for Ben Simmons. Yeah, there, there's no question about that. And Cam Johnson, has he's just really blossomed throughout the year, and he's the kind of lights-out shooter that you just can't leave. So if you put Booker, if you have Booker and Aiton to start, you put Bridges around him, you put uh, Cam Johnson, and then Rubio is the final piece. And you were saying this on the pod with Kevin Arnovitz. If you have poor point guard play, you're just not going to win in this league. And the Suns went two years with just an awful, awful point guard situation. So whatever you think of Rubio, just a really steady, professional, really solid point guard. It was just a massive improvement from what they had. So that was kind of the final piece to it. And now they have a good starting lineup. Their bench was terrible in the regular season. That's why they were 26 and 39. It's been a lot better in the in campaign. the bubble. But that campaign. campaign what he's been a revelation. The, what in the blue hell got into campaign? A guy who was a punchline, like the Bulls Absolutely. gave up assets for trading for trading for campaign, and are still mm-hmm. being made fun of to this day. Yeah, and he's just knocking down every open three. Um, so think about what you just said for a second. Mm-hmm. For two years, 
the Suns had absolutely horrible point guard play. Correct. Now zoom back out. Yeah. And think about how funny is that is. Yeah. Because when they signed Isaiah Thomas to an incredible contract, they then mm-hmm. had three starting level point guards who were yep. all instantly miserable and were like, I don't want any part of this. And mm-hmm. if you if you I don't know I can't remember a lot of franchises who had like, let's say a a, a six month period like the Suns had from January 2015 till summer 2015. Because let's mm-hmm. review what happens. They trade Dragic for the two Heat picks. Yep. Great trade. Dragic is on an expiring deal. He doesn't want to be there. Objectively great trade. If you hit the brakes right there. I know. Life is pretty freaking good. You don't yep. hit the brakes right there. You dump Isaiah Thomas for nothing. Now, Suns mm-hmm. defenders will tell you, not incorrectly... That dumping Isaiah Thomas for nothing helped them boost their helped them lose enough games to get Devin Booker in the draft. Yeah, which, sure, I guess. I mean, what a freaking bizarre world we live in when that's the way you can defend a trade. Um, and uh, then they trade what at the time was the most coveted trade chip in the NBA, probably a very mm-hmm. lightly protected Lakers pick for Brandon Knight, um, which went which went poorly, and um, that. That's just such a bewildering series of events. And I remember thinking at the time, everybody knew the Suns were on the hunt for a wing and a young wing. And that's what they were trying to get with the Lakers pick. And you looked around the league and you couldn't find any. Like there just weren't Mm going to be any that were available for that price that were worth that pick and available. And so you could almost talk yourself into like, okay, I get what they're saying. He's a borderline all-star. He's young. Like it makes a little bit of sense, but everybody knew it was it was the price was too high. Then that summer they signed Tyson Chandler, who's yeah. thirty whatever years old, drag his ass into their free agent pitch meeting as a surprise with Lamarcus Aldridge, who's whatever years old. Don't get Lamarcus Aldridge, and then just have Tyson Chandler on their team for some reason. And yeah. yet here we and, and then in and then after that is all the draft picks you just mentioned. And yet here we are, and I find myself like how in the hell did this happen? This is insane. Mm-hmm. How did it yeah. happen? I guess Booker's I mean, good and Aiton's good, and that's and you go from there. I mean, I th- I think it, it that's exactly it. Booker's that good, and then like what Philly did, you just want as many bites of the apple as you can. So okay, Dragon Bender, he didn't work out. Marquise Chris, he didn't work out. Josh Jackson, and guess what's happening? While well, these guys are terrible, you're still losing so many games that you're getting choice picks. So that eventually leads you to Aiton, and that led you to. Uh, this draft, we were able to get Cam, Cam Johnson, not Cam Payne, Cam Johnson and Dario Saric out of it, who are two uh, critical pieces to what they're doing now. So uh, you said, is it replicable? I don't know if you'd want to repeat it. The only thing you want to repeat is to get Devin Booker, and then you can figure it out from there and figure if you try enough times after that, it'll work out. And a lot of credit to James Jones, because uh, like we said, last offseason, didn't get the best reviews from people like you, Zach. But he's put a team that made sense. Even going ahead, getting Aaron Baines, really steady center. He kept them decent while DeAndre Ayton Which, was out for 25 games. By the games. way, that's a move I didn't like either because I thought they did. Yeah. I, they, they had Rashawn Holmes under contract for nothing. Rashawn yeah. Holmes is good. Well, he was and a free agent. Didn't they have an option on him or something? But um, He may have been an RFA. So, th- I mean, yeah, you, they could have kept him if they wanted him. Yeah. Um, and and then they they got Baines instead, and but Baines was like you said. I mean, there there were reasonable people being like, "Is Aaron Baines better than DeAndre Jordan?" Like seven months, whenever the season was going mm-hmm. on, they were like, "Maybe the Suns should just keep starting Aaron Baines." DeAndre Ayton, uh, yeah, DeAndre Ayton, yeah, um, definitely better than DeAndre Jordan right now. Yeah, that's that's not close. Um, it's really. It's really an incredible path, but their team does make sense. And an underrated mm-hmm. deal was the deal to get Ubre, who's not playing right yes, now and is, is, is not the shooter everyone thinks he is. But they got Ubre for Ariza, who didn't want to be there. And that that right. is like that is a home run trade. That's actually that's a predatory trade. That's looking mm-hmm. at a Wizards team that's desperate that thinks Trevor Ariza is the solve for all their wounds, salve, salve, however you say that, and um, can heal their locker room and all that, and and fleecing them. And like that that was a good trade, but that. That seven-year period is as wild as it gets. And, like, we haven't even mentioned the hair salon and Earl Watson getting fired three games into a season for reasons that are, like, still not murky, but, like, subject of lots of 
rumors and speculation. I mean, I don't know how you made it through, Mike, with, with your optimism intact. I mean, Devin Booker was a big reason why. You could see, to me, early on, I forget if it was his second or third year, but there was a game in Philly where they just couldn't guard him. He was making wild threes from everywhere. Um, and I just thought, this guy, he is that good. The first year, I, I wasn't sure. I mean, you saw some of the playmaking starting to come along, but he's just improved rapidly every year. So I think having that guy now in year five has certainly made it a little easier where you said, what's what's the biggest, what's the toughest thing in, in building a team? It's finding that, that number one scorer, right? So you have that, you figure you'll be able to find the rest of the stuff eventually. And like I said, just, just rooting for lottery balls. I did a lot, a lot of that over the last five to seven years. He's even better than I thought he would be at this stage, Booker. Like as optimistic as I was, he's, he's better oh, than me I too. thought. Um, he, um, what's changed for them in the bubble? What, why, are they, why are they destroying everybody in the bubble? What's changed? Honestly, I think it's the bench because they really didn't have one. During the pre-bubble time, the Suns' best on-off differential was Ricky Rubio. They were about 10 points better when he was on than off. And that's largely because who who is coming in when you had uh, your Elliot Kobos of the world, even Javon Carter when he was just the the point guard, certainly Ty Jerome who struggled quite a bit as a rookie. Now all of a sudden they're a plus when Rubio's out of the game. Uh, every game it feels like campaign is going off and uh, running off ten quick points in the Miami game. Uh, it was Javon Carter who hit a bunch of threes, and then Dario Saric has become kind of one of the anchors of the bench. He's Giving you fourteen or so points off the bench every night, and now he's all been of a sudden, huge. he's Backup been enormous. Center. And so again, they got criticized by. I mean, I don't know the draft well enough, but I everyone yeah. who does told me it was ridiculous to pick Cam Johnson at eleven. Yeah, and so they trade the sixth pick, which becomes Jared Culver, for yep. Cam Johnson and Dario Saric, who is a free agent this summer and do yep. I guess a pay raise. But Dario Saric, a- after getting lost for a while, this is a big. This is a big subplot to me. Dario Saric was not out of the rotation, but becoming a, a bit player in the rotation. Right. And and it had the feel of one of those things like, oh, he'll just leave in free agency for nothing. It was a failed yep. experiment. And now he's essential as a backup center, backup yep. power forward, started today. He's making shots. He's making plays. He's defending pretty well. Like, he's a good player. And to rediscover that guy has been sort of an underrated part of why they're 6-0. and yeah, no question. And you saw it even in the uh, exhibition games. He just came out firing. You could tell he knows he's a restricted free agent and he's trying to make that RFA money in what's going to be a pretty cold market. So he having him and campaign and then even Javon Carter, they, they've had a good bench. And that's really been the difference because the starting five, uh, when you have Ubre in instead of Cam Johnson, they were plus 20 per 100 possessions. It was one of the best lineups uh, for the entire season. Obviously, you had 25 games with no Aiton. But this team... When their guys were in, they were pretty decent all year. It's just been the bench was a complete tire fire, and now the bench has turned that into a positive. So I think finding campaign, like you said, rediscovering Sharich, those were the two key points that they were were so different. And Booker's maybe taking his game to another level, but, I mean, the guy was averaging 26-6. and six. He was already pretty much at that level. It's just when everything else comes together, you can see it more, and then you, you get things like the last second shot against the Clippers. And I don't, I don't think Booker is good defensively, um, but like I remember maybe a year ago there was a lot of like when Zach Levine started to pop in Chicago, yeah, you would hear a lot of Booker contrarians be like, well, I don't get what the difference is between Booker and Zach Levine. Like they're score scoring gunners on terrible teams, they're bad at defense. And I would say, and I think I even said this on a podcast once, like, yeah, I, I agree, Booker's not good defensively, but like he knows where to be. And yeah. how to play and how to position himself. He knows like the patterns of the opposing offense. He can recognize them in real time. I think he'll try harder on a good team when they yeah. get the coaching situation stabilized. And Levine is just he's a competitor. And and when you talk to him about defense, it's actually astonishing how it, 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 he's very smart about it. Like he knows the playbooks, but like that doesn't translate to the game. He's just mm-hmm. totally out of sorts in, in a way that Booker is not. Um, they're third in the bubble in defense. Again, this is before yeah. today's game. Um, they've actually been quite good at limiting opponent threes all season. And yep. their rim defense has improved a lot. Uh, and they haven't been turning the ball over until today when they fell behind turning the ball over a lot, which, of course, helps your defense. Um, and they've been 
what's really interesting is they've been defensive rebounding again until today. They they had like one of the top two or three defensive rebounding rates in the league, which mm-hmm. you look at their starting line for the bubble. I mean, when you look at their starting lineup, you would think, well, that could be a weak spot, and it and it hasn't been. And that lineup is you probably you can probably recite the stats to me. It's plus a lot. In yeah. very little, t- it's like plus fifty in a hundred minutes or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's um, the fourth best. Net, they're plus fifteen point five per hundred possessions, fourth best in the bubble now uh, with Cam Johnson instead of Ubre, obviously. So really, it almost doesn't matter who you put with the other four. They've been really good this year. What do you think? Let's assume they don't make the playoffs because the math is still against them. Yeah. Yep. What do you think are the important next steps for them as a franchise to make sure this is not one of those things where a team makes a leap and then it doesn't continue? Because it's not always linear. However, if you have Booker and Aiton at their ages, it should continue. But mm-hmm. what what are what are you focused on as a fan and a, and a very smart fan of this team? I mean, I think the biggest thing is you need to really figure out the bench. This has been uh, a great flash in the pan, but it's been six games so far. So... Uh, whether that means you got to re-sign Sharich, that's going to be key. You've got campaign under team control for one more year. So if, if you, I mean, you hope this isn't a mirage. And then maybe find one more bench guy who you can really rely upon. Um, in theory, that would be the Ubre, but, um, you know, there maybe one more shooter for the bench. I, I do think it's interesting what happens to Kelly Ubre if, yeah. he's, if he's just a bench player now because this lineup has worked so so well and you you mentioned before cam johnson is a capital s shooter he is not a guy who needs a ton of space he's not a guy who needs to be open that dude is a shooter and kelly Oubre is not kelly Oubre is an okay shooter but like he's not scaring anybody right and cam has held his own defensively this year in in a way that frankly nobody expected yeah i think i think Oubre is actually the biggest uh, thing that I'm interested for this offseason. He's got one year left on his deal before he becomes an unrestricted free agent. I don't know if I'm going to want to pay him what he thinks he's worth, uh, considering, like we said, we like the other five guys in the starting lineups. You got Aiton's extension coming up soon. You got Bridges coming up soon. So if he's not that guy, then you need to make that trade this summer and find somebody who maybe could be that long term six man. Do you so trust I think? Do you trust Do Aiton? Trust, you know, I think you almost have to, Zach, just because there's there's no other choice. Obviously, like what happened today, some immaturity issues. I do trust that he's going to continue to get better defensively. I do trust that he's going to be the rare big man who can play in the playoffs. And the three-point shot was kind of a revelation that, that came out of – I mean, we've been talking about it for two years, and finally he's, he's starting to hit threes. So I trust him to be the number two guy. I don't know if he'd ever be the number one guy in a title team, but um, you know, it's the guy's still in the second year, so I'm gonna, I'm going to remain optimistic on him. But I, I see where you're coming from with that question, certainly. No, I, I I'm optimistic about him. on offense. I, I've I've said before, like he's tricky to evaluate because for yeah. whatever reason with centers, we tend to put them into these boxes where you're a Tyson Chandler type or you're a passing big man who facilitates from the elbows. Or you're a stretch five like Brooke Lopez or Miles Turner. Mm-hmm. And he's not any of those things, but he's got pieces of all of them. Right. And I think that's actually a strength. That that's 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 a very good thing. And the challenge is good. Like he doesn't have to be he doesn't have to roll to the rim sixty times a game like Gobert. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have to shoot eight threes a game like Brooke Lopez. He can still do his half rolls and you gotta give him a couple post ups here and there, even if he's gonna fade away and never get to the line. But if you can just direct him 5% toward Tyson Chandler and 5% right. toward Brooke Lopez, and that's it, then you're talking about a player who has a chance to be a superstar offensively and not just a really good player. Yeah, I agree with you 100% because he can do all that. He's got the shooting touch. He's always had the soft touch for a big man. Uh, he's unstoppable rolling, which doesn't happen often enough. Like you said, he doesn't get to the line too often. That's something you'd hope he works on. Uh, he's not a guy you really throw the ball to in the post, although I guess almost nobody is these days, the the way the NBA is going, except for Embiid maybe. So I, I agree with you completely. If he just gets 5% better at, at a couple of those areas, and then to me the biggest thing is the rim protection because uh, if you're going to be building a championship-level defense, you have bridges, but you need that rim protector, and that's got to be him. And you got to go from being uh, what you, you call them average 
that he's got to become good or very good defensively, I think, for them to really take the next step from where they are fighting for the eighth seed to being more of a perennial playoff team. You mentioned you were at dinner with your dad during the 2015 trade deadline. I yeah. was in I was in the hospital. Uh, my wife had just given birth to our daughter the day before. Oh, wow. And so I will always remember that trade deadline. That's also the famous Woj, dear Lord, tweet. Yep. Because there were oh, just yeah. too many trades to keep track of. Yeah. Um, so is your dad is your dad a Suns fan? Oh yeah. Are you guys? Yeah. Is this is this been like? Is he? Where is he? And where are you? And are you talking oh, that, every day? Is this been a yeah, good father son thing? I, yeah, definitely. I'm in L. A. He he's back in Phoenix, and I mean we've been. Uh, he grew up in Chicago, so he was a Bulls fan. But then ever since '93, we've been on the Suns bandwagon. I was I was seven years old. Obviously, that was the year the Suns came back from the Westfall Guarantee, beat the Lakers after falling down 0-2 then played the Bulls in the finals and had John Paxson give me sports heartbreak for the first time, certainly not the last time. <laughs> and it's been, um, the Suns have always kind of been the one team that we've really watched together. Yeah, when you, the Suns have a weird thing where they're like, a, the last five or six years have been a, a little bit of a blip, but other than that, they've been consistently really good. And also the level of heartbreak has been, Unusual. I guess if you're consistently really good, you're mm-hmm. going to just run into a few of those if you never win. So you had the Ori hip check on Steve Nash. Oh, you yeah. have 93 finals. You have the 2010 conference mm-hmm. finals against the Lakers where you're a couple of random rebounds away from maybe going to the finals. Um, so yeah. I hope you're savoring this. I mean, you're again, the math isn't friendly, but who knows? There's still hope. Like no one thought there would be any hope. Right. No one thought that. And honestly, Zach, it kind of feels to me like the NCAA tournament because every game it's felt like if you lose, you're out. And that wasn't the math exactly at the beginning, but that's how it's felt every win. It's like, okay, you advance, you go to the next day, you go to the next day and you got to hope you get enough help. And, you know, so far, early part of the uh, the bubble, New Orleans was losing every game. Sacramento was losing. Portland lost at least two by now. They've gotten a bunch of help. They just need one more tiny bit of help. So it's it's been so fun, largely because it was unexpected. I know uh, some prominent ESPN writers didn't even think they should be invited to the bubble. Me, I said it. I copped to it in my column. Yeah. And by the way, I stand yes. by it because the NBA was supposedly like we got to limit the number of viral hosts, potential viral hosts. Like we're very concerned about um, the number of bodies that are there. I'm like, well, if you're concerned about the number of bodies, the Wizards mm-hmm. should not be here, and the Suns, who yeah. entered with a less than one percent chance of even finishing ninth and yeah. and they have and they've proven me I, I don't even think i was wrong frankly for that stance but they've proven everybody wrong it's extraordinary it's one of the best story it's a story frankly like we all needed something fun man we all yeah. needed something fun and like they've been awesome and the big thing you hope it's the springboard because you can kind of see what they are now there have been glimpses of it throughout the season they did start five and two with a big win over the clippers they did beat milwaukee uh, without Giannis, right before the break, put up a, a huge, huge scoring game. So we've seen glimpses of this team actually looking really competent this year, but never this kind of a stretch. They've never won more than six games since in the last 10 years. Uh, the 9-10 conference finals team was the last team to do that. So To win six looking, straight, yeah. To win, to win seven straight. Seven straight. They haven't um, won more than six straight since then. I'll, I said this when, when Kevin Pelton and I drafted teams – for the last preview podcast I did of the restart, I drafted the Suns and I said, if there's one team in the West next year, again, this is before the restart, mm-hmm. that that is going to have expectations to take a leap and a sizable one, like an eight, yeah. I think I said eight wins or something like that. It's Phoenix and they should have those expectations. I think this is, I think they have found a team, like you can quibble about the process getting there and we've quibbled yeah. and there's a lot of quibbling Definitely. to do. Um, but they have found a team structure that makes sense. And I think, look, I don't think they're going to win 50 games next year, but I think I think this is like a legitimately pretty decent team. Yeah, I agree with that. Like I said, they've got to figure out the bench because that was, that's was that been a huge issue all season and stay healthy, keep improving with their guys, but they've really found something with the starting five. They fit well off each other. you got a lot of shooting, uh, shooters all over the place. And defensively, like you said, they've been really, really good in the bubble. The other big question is what do they do with when Rubio's contract comes up, which is not yeah. for a bit, but like what, yeah. what does their point guard position look like um, 
in three years or four years. But that's any thoughts on that? Is that just too far off at this point? Yeah, I think it's too far off at looking two years in advance. I, I, he's got two years under uh, contract after this one. If they do miss the playoffs and move up in the lottery, I think that could be your answer, certainly. But otherwise, no, I, I think you can't look that far ahead just because we don't know. Obviously, 2021 free agency seems like everybody's a free agent. Uh, if they don't spend much this summer, they'll have some cap space. So maybe that's the answer. But yeah, I, th- I think it's too early to really know. I, I don't think that player's on the roster right now, certainly. So I think you'd be looking outside the organization at this point. You're not ready to max out campaign, tear up his contract, uh, give him the max extension? Uh, if he does this for eight games, maybe. Six games, not yet. All right, Mike, it's good to see your face, man. It really is one of the pleasures of going to L.A. is I, I run in there all harried and, and like mm-hmm. behind schedule, and there's always a smiling 30 seconds of Suns talk. And I've, oh, just, yeah. I just, I've been thinking of you for t- two weeks now. So savor it. Thanks for making a little time for, for the low post. And, uh, you know, fingers crossed you get a little luck for yourself here. I appreciate that. We'll have to do this again when the Suns are in the finals. There you go. Mike Schwartz, thank you. All right, welcome back to the Low Post Podcast, where I am thrilled to be joined by yet another person with a boring hotel curtain as their background from Orlando, the one and only, the Hall of Famer, the legend, Doris Burke. How are you? Doing great. Doing great. Back in the bubble. Arrived yesterday after being here for two weeks, a couple days off. I'm, I'm glad to be back. Oh, the bubble. I don't, <laughs> I don't have any FOMO about the bubble. You're feeling good. Everything's good. Job is good. The plug, you're getting used to the plexiglass and all that. I am. I am. It is an unusual angle and distance to call the game from, um, but I'm just so happy NBA basketball is back. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed, Zach, to be honest with you at a few things. Number one, the magnitude of what this league has been able to achieve, the cooperation they had between the Players Association and the league. You know, you look no further than, than Major League bus- Baseball and sort of what appears to be some distrust there. Um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm in awe of the logistics and how it, how it came to fruition. Um, and I just, I, what I'm amazed at is how crazy the eight, nine situation is, but also two through seven in the West. Like it is so convoluted and jumbled and, uh, I'm hoping you're going to take me through it cause I'm confused. <laughs> well, that's what we're on here to do two to seven in the West, but to, to your point about the league in the union, it is extraordinary. Uh, shockingly baseball's like, I guess their system is like the honor code that didn't work. So like, um, the real test for the league in the union will be next season. And if they have to find one of these bubbly ways to do it, whether it's three bubbles, four bubbles, one, it can't be one bubble. That's not fair to the players. And, and that's setting aside the issue of salaries and what's going to have to happen to salaries that are already written in pen uh, in the case of no fans, but let's not go there yet. Um, yes. Two to seven in the West. We know precisely zero matchups uh, in the first round in the Western conference. And um, it appears everyone is trying to lose like for some reason. Um, Houston, I think, is not playing hard in tonight. Denver went down the stretch without its guys uh, last night and still almost beat a Lakers team that was trying to win. The Jazz played their starters other than Mitchell in the first half and then pulled them all at halftime and fell from ahead against Dallas. So let me just take you through a couple of scenarios. Um, and this will, this made, is making my head explode, and there's a chance that I'm going to be wrong about something. <laughs> Currently, the Oklahoma City Thunder are 43 and 27 and in fifth in the West. They appear to be trying to lose, probably to keep their draft pick, which they owe to Philly, top 20 protected. If they lose out, they're 43 and 29. You with me so far? Yeah. 43 and 29. Utah is 43 and 28. They have one game left against San Antonio. If they lose out, they're 43 and 29. They appear to be trying to avoid Houston because they're petrified of Houston. Um, In doing so, they are now playing a very, very dangerous game where they could fall to seventh. Pelton has them in seventh in like 25% of scenarios because this this is like how crazy this is. If Dallas wins out, they go to 45 and 30. They've played extra games. By virtue of winning percentage, 45 and 30 is a better record than 43 and 29. Utah and Oklahoma City, if they lose out, then fall below Dallas. Even worse, 
43 and 29, 43 and 29. Utah loses the tiebreaker to Oklahoma City, if I'm doing this right, because Oklahoma City has a two to one head to head advantage. And do you know why Oklahoma City has a two to one head to head advantage? In part, because the season stopped when Oklahoma City was about to play Utah. That would be a fitting ending to this horrible wackadoo year if that game ends up shoving Utah it, or playing a role in shoving Utah to seventh. And so what I'm saying, a dangerous game, is like Utah wants to avoid Houston. If in avoiding Houston, you end up playing the Clippers in the first round, that's an L. I don't care how bad of a matchup Houston is for you. That's an L. And so, Doris, the basketball gods – sitting up on Mount Naismith <laughs> at this time of year are normally on high alert for teams that are trying to monkey around with yes. their playoff matchups it, because the, the basketball gods will seek to punish such teams for right. intentionally losing games. They rewarded right. Denver last year because the basketball gods have that much respect. They love Nikola Jokic. They want to watch his game. So they, they let Denver pass. The basketball gods are watching this. They don't know who to reward and who to punish. Everyone is tanking. Everyone is trying to lose for various reasons. Matchups, the Thunder pick situation. Uh, Denver has all these injuries and, and guys recovering from COVID. They're trying to rest people. Perfectly legitimate, in my opinion, given what they're recovering from. And I think the last variable is there's no urgency among any of these teams to get in or out of the Lakers bracket. Like in some years you say, well, I don't want to be four – because then I'm in the Lakers bracket, Denver telegraphed last night, they don't care if they're four. Because if they're four, if they fall all the way to four, that means Houston's three. I don't think they want to play Houston, but they can't anyway. And I don't think they really have any differentiation between Lakers black bracket, Clippers bracket. Teams view those, the, the, the other teams view the LA teams as roughly equivalent. So I don't know what the hell is going on, but I'll tell you this. If the Jazz end up seventh and they end up playing the Clippers – then the basketball gods will have inadvertently punished the Jazz for their, for their tankery. So, Doris, I ask you, all of these teams doing this, have you, do you feel like you've learned anything about any of them? Have any of them impressed you in the bubble? Have you learned any relevant information about any of these teams in the West? Well, I would say that you could understand why the Jazz, in the absence of Boyan Bogdanovich, would try – to be the team most likely to gerrymander a matchup in the first round, right? Because they had to figure out who they, they had to do, figure out who they are and how they win, understanding that they're always going to value spacing and three-point shooting and all those things without Boyan. But I felt like their ecosystem, their personnel was so shaky after their starters Joe Ingalls, even with Boyan Bogdanovich. Shaky may be the wrong word, but certainly there were challenges there. So I understood it. And I think you saw versus Denver to me, like when they got out of the gate shooting the ball horrifically through their first three games, like below 30% from three, I'm thinking, this is trouble. Like they're a mess. And then you see some glimpses of the spacing and the catch and shoot threes and all the things that make them successful. So I understood that. Um, you know, I saw something, I think you wrote something about their ninth man issue or whatever the terminology you called it was. Um, how much pressure do you think is on Joe Ingles right now in whatever matchup they have? And if they're the Clippers, forget about it. And I understand them trying to avoid Houston. But like the play of Joe Ingles as they go into the playoffs, should they be able to get a matchup they think is good? Just how important... <laughs> Huge yeah. huge for them, but for, to, to your point, their new starting lineup, Conley, Mitchell, Ingles, O'Neal, Gobert, is plus 30 in 84 minutes in the bubble. The Jazz overall are minus 31. So that tells you how bad every single other lineup they've played in the bubble has been. They're getting destroyed by every other – when every other lineup is in. Um, you know, I – you know – the Houston thing, I get it. They're sick of seeing James Harden. James Harden versus Gobert is a little bit of a tough matchup. I actually think that's been overplayed a little bit. I, I thought after the first couple of games in the playoffs last year where Utah was trying these really gimmicky defenses to try yeah. to stop Harden, that yeah. didn't really work. Um, they settled in, and, and they lost the rest of the series primarily because they couldn't make open shots, which is sort of right. like the thing that happens to Utah in the playoffs every year. They stop making open threes or decent threes. Um, I just so, – so the reason 
the, the Clippers, so there's some, the Clippers could actually fall all the way to four in some scenarios. That's how wild this is. Houston could pass them. However, last night, if Denver had found a way to win last night with Bull Bull and then Mason Plumlee guarding uh, LeBron down the stretch. And by the way, Denver down three on the last play of the game went for a layup at the buzzer. Like, what are you doing? What, like, what are we, what are we even, uh, I, is, and Bull Bull missed. Uh, if they had won that game, it would be pure chaos. But now L.A., the Clippers are very likely to get number two only because they just all they have to do is win once, regardless of what Denver does, regardless of what Houston does. And their last game against Oklahoma City is against Oklahoma City, which it doesn't appear to be trying super-duper hard to win these games. So the Clippers will probably be two, in which case seven to me is just a place you don't want to be. I still think the Clippers are the best team. We haven't seen that team. Harrell hasn't played yet. Lou's only played a couple of games after the uh, Lemon Pepper Wings incident of 2020. Um, yeah, Kawhi sat a game. PG sat a game. Uh, I, you know, I just think that's a place you don't want to be. It, it's to- like Dallas could go all the way up to fifth. Um, it's it's a complete. I, you know, I guess, I guess it's just like all these teams are really good, and so can we talk, can we talk about Denver because sure. I find I talk I find them fascinating. So the, the Michael Porter Jr. with the two-man game of uh, Murray and Jokic, and Murray has shocked me. Number one, the way they played with him and threw him in his first game back and how it went way past the minutes, and I was just shocked at how good he looked, Zach. Um, I, I don't know. I just was shocked at how good he looked, at, at how much they played through him. Where, where, what is the appropriate balance for Michael Porter Jr.? You know, they, they, Michael Malone made a huge point to say, you know, prepare for a hundred green game grind. Obviously it's, you know, funky year to that. How tired Jokic was down the stretch, missing the free throw that he was, you know, devastated about and going into Michael Malone's office. Um, you know, how many field goal attempts is appropriate in a playoff scenario for Michael Porter Jr.? Junior, do you ever trust him to handle the ball more? Um, is he is he capable of like Clay Thompson, thirty plus point quarters, that level hot? I mean, the shot making he did against LeBron James, elevation point, unbothered by somebody eating up his space. Like, how do you think he he uses Michael Porter Jr. in the playoffs on the offensive end? I think the uh, – what is the expression? I think the horse is out of the barn. Is that what happens when something's already – the toothpaste is out of the tube? Something is out of something. And yeah. I, I think that um, I think that Michael Porter Jr. is going to start. I haven't talked to Mike Malone about it. I don't know where his head is. I'm not going to bug him about that from outside the bubble. I just think he's played too well. And I understand that – he's going to make some positioning mistakes on defense. He's going to rotate when he shouldn't rotate. And then he's not going to rotate when he should on the weak side here and there and all that. He's also going to make up for some of those mistakes because he's huge and fast and can jump out of the gym. And like, that's the gift of super duper athleticism. You can start from 10% behind and make it up in a way that, you know, Will Barton can't because he's not as tall and he's not as explosive. Will Barton's a great athlete too. Um, I just think the scoring is too prolific and the shooting is too prolific. And I said this with Jeff um, last week, Jokic is screaming out to play with shooting. If you give the ball to Jokic at the top of the arc and your entire offense is just the other four guys screen and cut until someone comes open. Well, a LeBron like he's the best passing big man ever in the NBA period. Full stop. He's going to find the right guy at the right time. And Gary Harris, 33% from deep the last two seasons, Will Barton average Millsap stretch power forward. Never happened. Not, not, a, not a good enough three point shooter. Jamal Murray for all the hype 34% this year, I think 35% for his career. Now I think Jamal Murray will become a 39%, 38% three point shooter, but he's not right now. I agree. Jokic is begging for someone to pop out of those actions and just start draining threes. And I think at this point, Denver with its current starting lineup with Barton and Harris has been good. Very good. Actually, that's a good lineup. I just don't think they have enough pop 
to really have a realistic chance of getting out of the West. And it sounds ridiculous to say Denver getting out of the West. Guess what, man? That's your goal now. Like this cutesy stuff, you made the second round last year. You're, you have a franchise player in his prime. You have a loaded team full of depth. Like get some ambition. And I think they have some ambition. And, and Michael Porter Jr. brings a little bit of downside, but he raises their ceiling a little bit higher starting and playing 30 minutes a game. And I'm ready for them to make that move. So then the rest of the group, it, because it, it goes to, you know, the Will Barton uh, conversations last year, start, don't start, what's his attitude toward that, all of those things, you know, Tory Craig, like um, just how you can play him defensively, who he creates problems for. Is this a circumstance where everybody on that team in terms of its chemistry and non-talk, you know, just except on certain nights, Craig has got to be on the floor and you hope that he makes enough shots because what he's providing uh, defensively, you know, it's been such a long, hard two years for Gary Harris, but he's, is he still their best perimeter defensive player um, at times? And where does he fit into this? There's so many questions. And Denver is a, is a fascinating team to me. And it's been a lot of fun to watch them and see Michael Porter Jr. And know where I was in October and asking Mike Malone where he fit. And Mike Malone, like, like the coach's coach, you know, I feel like the trust factor is always big with him. Trust. Do I trust you? Do I trust you in these minutes? I guess that's the case for everybody, but uh, it's interesting. Um, I, 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 I get it. I mean, co- there's nothing that drives coaches more crazy than blowing defensive assignments. And like they're, yeah. they're, they'll over, and on the flip side, a lot of coaches will overlook everything else if they can rely on you on defense, if you can't make a shot, if you can't dribble, if you can barely walk on offense, but you can be relied upon on defense, they'll trust you. Uh, to me, it's just, it's too bad. Now Denver is still um, likely to get the three seed. Houston can pass them and get, um, get the force to get the three seed. So, but I, I just don't think Denver cares. Houston is like Russ has sat the last two games, hard and sitting tonight. Gordon has not played at all um, in the bubble. Yet they're four and one. Now, you know, they beat Milwaukee. That was an impressive win. Uh, no Bledsoe, but Giannis played. They beat the Lakers without Braun. Eh. They beat the Kings. Yeah. Total disaster for the Kings. Get out of the bubble. Goodbye. See you next year. Um, okay. And they had that crazy opening game against Dallas in double overtime or whatever it was. I, I guess I'm impressed with Houston going four and one, given all the players that have missed games. Um, ben McLemore looks reliable. He's- he um, looks great. I, I've never seen that young man carry himself on a basketball court the way – I mean, he doesn't hesitate. He's, he's lively. And make, the way he's making shots and just – it's – you know what? It's so great because guys who seem to be teetering on the edge of being out somehow play for Mike D'Antoni and things look different. Is there too much on the shoulders of P.J. Tucker on the defensive end of the floor? Can they overcome their – you know, rebounding issues. Sometimes that scares me. Um, Their rebounding I, has been predictably bad since they went without a center. They've made up for it in all the ways that they are designed to make up for it, forcing a lot of turnovers and shooting a ton of threes. Like they beat the Lakers in that game without Braun. Now, again, the Lakers without Braun don't generate threes and they don't generate shots at the rim at nearly the same level. They shot 57 threes and the Lakers shot 19. You, you just can't win. In the NBA in 2020, you cannot win shooting one-third as many threes as the other team. It's, not, it's, it's almost mathematically impossible. And I think it's very interesting. I don't think Utah is the only team that's a little bit scared of Houston. I think there are a few teams that if they had their druthers, whatever a druther is, if they had their druthers, they would prefer to avoid Houston. And I think it's really interesting. It's, like, it's not like Houston has blown the doors off the league, but it's interesting that teams are wary of them because they're so different stylistically. They have a player in Harden who can just not only erupt for 50, but just sort of breaks every conventional defense and every rule of the NBA that has existed in the past. And they're just so different that like everyone is a little bit scared of them. And, and, and again, the, the math, like if they shoot 63s, if they make 25 or right. 22, it's not a great percentage, but the math becomes overwhelmingly on their side. They're a little bit of a scary team. I don't know what to make of their performance so far, but I think it's largely encouraging. 
I mean, you know, can they, uh, this is a fascinating question to me because can they overcome, like, so in a matchup against size, you know, I don't know. All right, let me ask you this. Jokic, I, Jokic is the one everyone wants to see because Jokic is the post scorer in the West who you can actually give the ball to. Right. And not only can he score, he can, not only can he score in a way that's like bulldozing smaller guys, yeah. maybe not Tucker, nobody can bulldoze PJ Tucker. Uh, but he can pass, and so. But but I don't even think they're particularly scared about that because a, we'll front and double and do crazy stuff and force the other guys to make shots, and b, we're gonna pick on Jokic every single time down the floor. We're gonna Correct. find him and have his guy screen for for Harden. He has to guard every single time, every single time. They're just gonna target, target, target. It'll be interesting. And what if you you know, what if Austin Rivers gets hot like you know the other night? Ooh, forty one. <laughs> He has a stretch of a series where he's problematic for people. The Eric Gordon thing is a big deal to me. I just think, I agree, I'm intrigued by the atypical nature of what they do, but I, I just think you have to have everybody. And uh, his shot making, the efficiency with which he gets it off, the range with which he shoots it, changes things. I just think you need every shot maker at your disposal. Macklemore's got to prove it in the playoffs. Um, I mean, we're best case scenario for them, for the in the Rockets in your mind. Do you legit like, best case do you scenario? Think they come out. Do you think they have a legitimate shot to come out of the West? Uh, I don't think they come out of the West, but I, well, those are two different questions. Am I picking them to come out of the West? No. Do I think they have a legitimate shot? If you define legitimate shot at like greater than fifteen percent, yes, I think they have a legitimate shot to come out of the West. I've said I think we all, all think the Clippers, right? I just think the Clippers. The Clippers have so much. You know, I, I'm, I'm interested. People are watching the Clippers, the Lakers, and the Bucks, and saying, huh, not as invulnerable as they were in March. That's and right. I just, I'm just sort of like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't know which of those teams, pick any of them. Which of those teams has actually, are you actually worried about any of them? Or is there a performance um, – in these games, given the circumstances, is it meaningful to you at all? I think that's been the most difficult thing is evaluating what the games mean relative to your playoff performance. And I'm not sure there's, you know, on a nightly basis, Zach, I have to look at who's playing for how long. Um, and as you made, you know, you came on the podcast documenting now after the first week, all of the machinations of these teams, whether it's seeding, picks, matchups, it is so difficult to know. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. I heard Nick Nurse talking about, uh, and, and we haven't even touched on Toronto, who I think is so legitimate. I, I said on a, a game in the first week, I, I believe they are legitimate. And it's funny, in talking to Frank Vogel and before their matchup, he said, legitimate to come out of the East. He said, I think they're a legitimate team that can defend their title. But Nick Nurse was talking about having to have, through the first part of the, the opening games, having to play his starters so much because he wanted to get them in shape and find a rhythm with them. And I just, there are so many variables that these coaches are dealing with, you know, in their own teams, personnel, getting, getting shape, getting rhythm, getting all these things. I'll be honest with you, I, I don't know what to expect. And I think that's pretty great. Here's my, here's my worry meter. Um, not worried about the Clippers at all. Clippers are fine. Nothing, nothing about their performance has worried me. Um, a little bit worried relative to what I was in March about both the Lakers and the Bucks. The Bucks just haven't, they haven't looked quite as to not together, they just haven't looked the same to me in the bubble. At times they do, they haven't put together a full game yet that makes me think, all right, the Bucks are the Bucks are ready to go. Bledsoe, who's been an important part of their team, is is just coming back from having COVID. Um, you know, I they they're they're finagling with different kinds of lineups. I think they're fine. I think they're fine, but their performance has been. I'm not completely dismissing the fact that they've been meh in the bubble. Lakers, you know, again, the lack of urgency is real, right? I mean, they have the number one seed. They essentially walked in with the number one seed. 
I, I do think losing Bradley and Rondo has hurt their has hurt them more than a, a lot of a lot of the snickering, like all oh, those guys don't matter. I, they matter just because of who has to play their minutes, and those players are worse than they are. And so, and their offense, offense has been bad. Their offense when LeBron sits has been bad all year. It still is. So I, I I'm a little bit worried, but I will say this: the number one seed, I think, still carries enormous benefits, particularly if Dallas is seventh. Now, I actually think Dallas is, has a really good chance to get out of seventh. For As well as Portland, is for all the Portland stuff, A, it's not even close to a guarantee that Portland is getting the eighth seed, period. Right. Memphis right. is still the mathematical favorite for it. And if the Lakers get Memphis, that should be a walkover. Um, and Portland, they're the second worst defense in the bubble, they're playing as hard as they can with their very best lineups and Dame playing 40 minutes a game. And they're like squeaking out these games against teams that are half trying to win. I just don't really buy Portland as a super legitimate threat to the Lakers the way some people do. I I just want to go back to the point about uh, Avery Bradley because, and maybe people snicker. I don't snicker because I just know how many points they generate in transition and how many jet points the Lakers generate off steals. And it just in those playoff games where easy baskets matter, the pressure he applies at the point of attack. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's one game, but the shot making had against the Clippers, et cetera, et cetera. I just think that's a big deal. That pressure at the point of attack, you know, we've talked about Milwaukee historically great Zach protecting the rim. Well, you know, cycle out to the point of attack with Bledsoe and the pressure he applies and disruption and all of those things. I just, I mean, uh, listen, winning NBA basketball games is hard. Winning a championship is hard. There's some luck required, but all your pieces are required as well. So I agree with you about the Avery Bradley. Have we hit the story enough? One thing that's fascinating that I just keep going back to in my head about the Lakers offense is something that uh, Frank Vogel said to us before a game. He just casually mentioned how significant he thought Anthony Davis's three-point shooting would be to the ultimate success of the team. And I am just curious to watch that play out in the playoffs. He's such a devastating offensive force, but those two men have got to be great, and I mean great, after the first round. Well, gonna, it's it's important gonna, because – the construction of their team is he essentially has to shoot threes because they're playing 30 plus minutes a game with the traditional center on the floor. So he he can't enough. Does he have enough equity in his own mind with his three point shooting in the crucible of a playoff series to make it, make it, make it. I don't think he does. If you're asking me a point blank, I don't think he does. I think teams are going to live with Anthony Davis shooting above the break threes. And I don't think he's going to make enough. And I think if you keep leaving him open, He's going to second guess himself and take a dribble in and cycle over to the handoff over here if he misses a couple in a row. Um, but uh, I do think the Lakers and the Bucks have the air also of like, we're going to worry about them. And then game one of the playoffs is going to come and they're going to destroy these teams. Be like, oh, okay. They, these teams are just playing possum kind of uh, this whole time. I especially kind of feel that way about the Bucks. Um, and, and again, the, the, the Lakers first round matchup, I think will be super favorable. Let me, let me turn um, to Toronto, Boston for a second. Um, the most anticipated game of the bubble, I think, after opening night was Toronto-Boston last weekend. And Boston wiped the floor with the Raptors. And as someone who is a Raptors, I'm a big Raptors believer. You are a big Raptors believer. Did that one game, and I believe Boston is now 3-1 and one for the season against Toronto, did that one game change your take at all about how a second-round series between those teams might unfold? I couldn't have been more impressed. Kemba Walker uh, seems to be well, marching toward wellness, and and that's significant. Listen, you you have, you know, four guys on the perimeter. You're you're because of Toronto's level of defense. You need what the Boston Celtics have on the offensive end of the floor. And uh, it, did it change my thinking? Of it? it certainly made my belief in Boston's ability to compete consistently and, and maybe beat Toronto, who I'm a big believer in. Yes, I guess the answer to that question is, is yes, it did. I, 
I mean, I can I can see you, and I can see the anguish on your face as you answer this question. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's Boston is fascinating to me. Uh, Tice, I'm going to be honest with you. I underestimated Tice from the outset in terms of what he could provide to. What, is Robert Williams solidified himself as the backup center there, or does Cantor, you know, in certain matchups become? I don't know. I mean, that's that's an interesting thing. I, I say I'll say this to you, like in that game. I thought Wanamaker, like, you know, nothing. You look at Brad Wanamaker, and I go back to, to him at Pittsburgh. There is nothing eye popping about Brad Wanamaker, not one thing. But you want to talk about strong as a, a rock, fearless, steady, you know, do everything you, you want him to do. Um, I just, I, I had been worried about Boston's bench, and then, you know, I see Brad do what he did in that game. I don't know. Well, they need one. They need one perimeter guy off the bench every night, right? right. They need one guy. Wanamaker is your most likely suspect. They sprinkle in an Ojale or a Langford, right. um, because they have six starters, right? Six, let's call them six. Smart is your sixth starter. Right. Right. Um, five of them are perimeter guys, so they don't need a whole lot of perimeter juice off the bench. They just need like ten good minutes from somebody. But yeah. you nailed it. To me, the lesson of that one of the lessons of that Toronto game was when Boston gets good minutes from its centers, they go from really good team to contender. And Tice was fantastic in that game. And to answer your question, Robert Williams is the Michael Porter Jr. of the East, not in terms of talent level, but in terms of, I think he's forced Brad Stevens to go, like, you're, it's time. You're the backup center. Cantor will still get minutes because yeah. there are certain matchups where he's useful. But to me – what Robert, he's again, he's going to make mistakes. He's a young player. The verticality he brings, the rim protection, the passing, he's a really good passer. I think it's just their upside is just higher if he's getting 15 minutes and Cantor's getting five or whatever it ends up being. Um, and when their centers like Tice made those corner threes against Toronto, that game, to answer my own question, did change the way I feel about that series. I think Boston. I think Boston's size bothers Lowry and Van Vliet a little bit. That's absolutely the case. Look at what those two guys shot from three. There's no question that bothers those guys. And the other thing is Boston, according to Cleaning the Glass, is the number one transition defense in the league, and it's not close. And you could see against Toronto, they were especially attentive to all of their principles in transition defense, and they were going to force Toronto to beat them in the half court. And that is the one – not quite red flag, we'll say like orange flag about the Raptors, is can they score enough in the half court? They're right around 15th, 16th in half court efficiency. And against Boston, the answer was no. And those things, I think, I think in the aggregate against 29 teams, Toronto is a slightly better team than Boston. I think head-to-head, -head, it's a toss-up where I might lean Boston after watching them play enough times this year head-to-head. -head. What what ultimately do you think um, does the environment itself matter in the playoffs? The fact that there's no uh, home court advantage does it does it help the young guys maybe perform beyond expectations? Where some of that tension in the building, the momentum swings of the home team do you do you think that this environment matters at all? relative to success in the playoffs act. And I, cause I saw, I saw, and you said essentially what Kenny Smith said on TNT's uh, uh, show one night, which is um, when I watch the games, it feels to me, I know for the announcers and the people in the building, it feels different, but for the viewer at home, it does not. And you essentially said the same thing. But do you think the environment matters and could it elevate somebody beyond where maybe their, their talent and their play and everything would, would, would dictate otherwise? I'm so glad you asked that because the stupid thing that I forgot up front, it's like one of the reasons there's all this tanking is that home court advantage doesn't exist. So it doesn't really matter, you know, four, five, two, three, whatever. Um, right. You know, um, a couple – I. I you, you, you first look at the teams that are really good at home and really bad on the road, like Philly, and say, what does that mean? Now, maybe Philly's season is on the brink anyway with yeah, all the injuries, right. and I can't, I can't get there. But, um, I, you know, 
I just sort of, this is such a, an unknown that I've just sort of defaulted to like, I'm going to trust the veteran teams, the teams that, the teams that have guys who have been through lots of different situations and lots of high pressure moments. The other thing is if I were one of these teams, I would be trying to get, I want, I want to start planning now for like big games in the playoffs when, um, when like the, would someone on the other team is at the free throw line at a big moment I want to get like a really surprising pop in in the virtual fans. Like all of a sudden there's a giraffe wearing a party hat in the virtual. All of a sudden there's like Selma Hayek in, in the virtual fans or like just something that's like, whoa, was that? I'm starting. They, uh, teams need to start planning. Um, teams need to start planning for that. Be the college teams that uh, pretend to deliver a baby there on the on the end line. Right? Something like like there's there's Trump in the vert like just throw just right. I'm just like like I'm like you could really have to think outside the box. Um, what else, what else did we not hit on DB? Can I can I give a moment of appreciation for Damian Lillard because uh, just going back to the start of the year where the guy had so much weight on his shoulders and um, his willingness to absorb it and then. Um, and then just watching him perform, um, I just – I'll start, stand in awe sometimes of the guy's skill set and then his leadership and just the way he approached this. And he took some heat um, uh, for, you know, saying, I, I don't want to go down there if there isn't meaningful games. But, you know, you have to always – you can't take things out of context. What he said was correct. I agreed with it when he said it, and I, I agree with it now because, you know, I just – I would have liked to have seen that team with a healthy Nurkic and Collins throughout because, you know, where would they be in the standings? How much more intriguing would the West be? Um, so just a, just a shout out to Damian Lillard for, for who he is as much as how he plays that. Well, and then just the way that he didn't, not only did he not hide from missing the free throws, yes. he said he just right. straight face, not, not sneering, just said, I've put those guys out of the playoffs before. They can laugh at me all they want. They know what I did to them. I love and I agree. And then the humility to say in the Chris Haynes interview, Zach, to say, I'm not above failure. Like, what a message for young players out there. As hard as he works, no one is above failure. That's what I'm saying. There's just, there's something that's fun for me to watch as it relates to his basketball skill. But there's also this competitive greatness and then this humility about this this guy that is so you know it's just compelling to me he's really compelling the last thing I forgot what I was going to say the last I remember what I was going to say the last thing about the the lack of home court Jeff Van Gundy brought this up the other night on the broadcast and it's it's right and it's obvious and it's something that's going to become a bigger story we are right now living the NBA is living not by any choice of its own an experiment and the experiment is how good is the basketball over a sustained period of time if these guys never have to travel? And if, oh. the, and if the answer is incredibly good, if we get to the finals and LeBron, if the Lakers are there and LeBron's voice carries so much weight, if LeBron says, I've never felt like this in the finals before, this is incredible, the NBA has inadvertently produced evidence that travel – maybe, maybe – it's inadvertently produced evidence that travel is so detrimental to the quality of play and the lack of travel is such a boost to the quality of play that um, they sort of like, do we really just go back to how it always was? I, I guess the answer, obviously there are 29 arenas you do and you play 82 and you travel, but you almost look, even, it, all of the noise about the schedule and the, tr- and, and, and the wear and tear it brings becomes so much louder and more obvious because now we have, if it unfolds this way truly, and so far the players are moving incredibly fast, the quality is amazing. If it unfolds that way, the NBA has this three month period where it's like, oh yeah, we did that thing once with no travel and it was awesome and everybody loved it. They can't do it. I mean, the BRI, right? But you I can't mean- do it. And the player, you can't play in a bubble. The players have their families, but it just, it will raise the volume on the discussion of it like, will. is so- 82 really how many we want to play? How many, you know, like, it, like because now it's, it's just really interesting. I thought it was a great point by Jeff. It is a great point. And, and, and I thought, you know, I was, but like, there's no answer to it, Zach. No. It goes the great story and forgive me, I can't remember who read it and it was, it was the real problem or whatever about the sleep deprivation, like, and all the, 
so the travel, but the sleep deprivation that comes with that travel, um, and then all the other taxing things about travel. So all, what I'm saying I, is all the people who think the schedule should be 60 games shorter. or 50 yeah. games will yeah. have a huge oh, bullet yeah. now that they did not have before. If it had, Now, maybe we get there and LeBron's like, I don't feel any different. I'm still worn down. It doesn't make a difference. I just think that's a very a, a potentially big story to monitor. All right, you got to go, DB. I don't want to keep you. I got to go and, get tested. Thank you for having me. Don't miss your test. Don't pull at DeAndre Ayton. Get over there on time. Doris I, Burke. I, I've almost forgotten it, so I totally get it for those players because there's been like a couple of days where it's 10 of 1 and I'm panicking like, oh, my God, I've got to go get there. Do you have, How much distance do you have to cover? Like, do you have to – is, is there like a mile sprint that you've got to do? Is there – is there – are they coming – they're coming to you, right? It's right in the hotel. I have to walk down to a ballroom. Yeah. <laughs> it couldn't be easier. All right, Doris, we'll reconvene the during, the, during the finals. Thank you for your time. Have fun. Yeah. Bye, Zach. Thanks.